for those of you don't, that don't know David, he has been uh, working in engineering in New Zealand and overseas for nearly 50 years. He's a, a fellow of Engineering New Zealand and a, and a well-known uh, earthquake engineer. He's been working as a consultant and as a university lecturer as well. And this webinar came about after uh, I was, uh, after a member of Engineering New Zealand said to me, we do the lessons to be learned, which focus on the failures of engineering, but why don't we celebrate some of the successes as well? And I thought, what a fabulous idea. And I was talking to David a short time afterwards and, and he sent me this, uh, this idea about the, the New Zealand hangar extension. And so uh, we're very lucky to, to have David here today. It's a, it's a good example of a project that went well. And he's here to discuss some of the challenges and how they overcome them. And at that point, I will um, hand it over to you. Thank you, David. Okay, thank you, Martin, and thank you, Holly, and uh, welcome everybody. Um, yes, Martin. Martin had the idea that that we could draw some lessons, and I'd sent him uh, what will be sent to you, which is a write-up of this project I did some years ago. In fact, I think it was uh, 2016 because it was 40 years on. Anyway, what we're, we're doing is just going to go through a few uh, slides. I'll show you the. Um, outline of the uh, presentation. Just a bit of background, uh, fully illustrated right throughout. But project description, we'll touch on some memorable moments. And uh, towards the end, we'll look at, you know, what has changed since 1976 in all sorts of ways in the engineering world, and what has stayed the same. Uh, you might like to ponder some success factors and looking back. And as Martin mentioned, uh, there will be a write-up available. You can take whatever notes you like, but there will be, and it's it's got a lot more comments on each slide than I will be making this morning or this afternoon. So let's begin. <clears throat> the, the This is the Air New Zealand maintenance base at Air, um, Auckland Airport, as it was probably in the early 70s, but it was actually built in the 1960s for Electra aircraft and DC-8s. And what you can see here uh, is the hangar, which has three bays, workshops in the back here. Uh, there's an engine test cell here and other ancillary buildings associated with maintenance of aircraft there. So the <clears throat> project I'm describing, there was already a, uh, an alteration to the center bay, which I'll talk about a bit more in a minute but was to extend the hangar out this way to fill in that area there and create a span inside here, which was big enough for 747s. Now, this figure shows the original structural concept, which you can see the, the three bays, a buttress at each end, a sliding joint there, the centre bay was, was larger, 54 metres, than the uh, outer two. This was wide enough for actually when they changed from DCH to DC-10s and they made the centre um, access for, for the DC-10s. But focusing on this original uh, design, which was done by Neil Allardyce and Dave Tom from Kingston Reynolds, Tom and Allardyce, which became KRTA, which became Sinclair Knight Mertz, which became Jacobs, uh, or Kingston Morrison I left out there. Um, but the, the, innovatively, this was, was built on the ground and clad on the ground and lifted up as a whole roof. Now you've got a main truss that goes across the front and these inclined trusses span from front to back. There were some cunning things done with the doors if you look at the doors to the left there, they were angled. So there's the pin joint there and a pin joint there. And there, uh, whoops, gone a bit too far. Uh, and that gave a bit of extra room for, for to get aircraft in. This is the 1972 uh, revision to the hangar where the main truss was cut to allow DC-10s to fit into this hangar, and a splice was made in the main truss, and that was work done by Peter Emery and 
Trevor Robertson of KRTA at the time. So that was the status of the building for, at the start of this project. DC-8s uh, here and DC-10s were just uh, starting in service and they needed uh, the room there. But uh, on the scene in the early to mid 70s was the Boeing 747, which was a much bigger aircraft. And they want, Air New Zealand wanted to create a space where they could service those. So here's a plan of how that South Bay was extended. So here's the column, uh, intermediate column. Here's the original buttress and the original truss was spanning along there. Our project basically took a, made a new truss to span from this existing column, cantilever over here to pick up some of the uh, center span and then span all the way to a new buttress and support here, uh, transfer the loads, take out the, take out the buttress and add a new roof, shift the amenities block because it, it was constraining the length for a DC-10 and the DC-10 just put it in there. There's a bit of a summary of before and after, if you like, in terms of the DC-8, the DC-10, the 747 as far as the South Bay, which is the subject of this project. So after the South Bay, the only thing that couldn't happen was they couldn't get a 747 in lengthwise. It's, it was way too long. But uh, they were able to um, fit it into that bay, which was a great boon. And of course, one of the things that they were very keen to do because all the workshops were there was to locate any new bay for a 747 close to the existing workshops. Well, you've seen that photo <clears throat> at the start, but it, it shows really the new buttress uh, constructed, a little frame here to take the new truss, uh, a tie which would extend, the, this is the top cord of the existing main truss, which takes those uh, trusses that span from front to back. And this tie, this tie was extended, this in the project, this was extended to pick up this new buttress. So the old buttress is there. And here is the, the new truss uh, sitting on the ground waiting to be lifted up. And below is a photograph of the completed project. Now that's not the end of the seminar, folks, but uh, um, one of the things we did in this project was we, we took some trouble, as you must, to obviously to work out how you were gonna do this job. And we set it down in a construction memorandum, which was part of the contract documents. And it showed the various steps, which I basically just outlined, um, a new buttress, a tie coming in here, um, preparations of joints, a new truss going in, transfer of loads, um, whoops, cutting of this uh, existing truss, to a, which is where the tailplane would go, uh, taking the load out of this existing truss and transferring it into the new one, uh, and removing the existing buttress, putting a new roof and walls in, and extending the doors. So that's a very quick outline of the construction process, actually basically very straightforward, just on a reasonably uh, large scale one of the things that we um, we were we um, we were asked to do, of course, that that aircraft maintenance was actually going on in the centre and North Bay while we were working on the South Bay, and we were we had to be really really careful about uh, any damage or dropping dropping bits of equipment and damaging planes. So that was a constraint on the whole project. I should mention that we were complimented by the Manukau City Council, who had a, at that stage, had a, a city engineer by the name of Mike Wesseldean, who was very complimentary about our, our consent documentation, which included this, of course. And so he was able, and he and his team were able to understand what was proposed when they, when they were charged with uh, granting a building consent. So that's worth, um, worthy of note. 
Now, the trust itself, just to give you an idea, is quite a, quite a large um, truss. The top cord is about 500 millimeters diameter, and the wall thickness is um, up to 26 millimeters thick, so it's a big hunk of steel. It's API, line, uh, American Pipe Institute line pipe, it was. Um, I was concerned as to how um, narrow I could make the bottom of this without this whole thing becoming unstable. Uh, in those days, computer analysis was not common. Uh, Barry Davidson, who was at the University of Auckland at that time and now runs CompuSoft, uh, gave uh, helped out with analysis there. Another thing that was tempting was to, to do profile cutting of the tube to make these joints, but it seemed more safer to me to use gusset plates and make sure the load was transferred. Again, profile cutting and those sort of techniques and technologies probably much more advanced than they were in New Zealand uh, 46 years ago. You can get some idea of the, the setup there, the span uh, you can see. Now, one of the things is that if you look down the bottom there, that's the top cord of one of those trusses that spans from front to back. And that's the cross section of the top cord of the existing truss. Now, with temperature, this would move backwards and forwards. And so I was, was not, we were keen to make sure that this could do that without uh, affecting the truss. So hence a pin joint here and a pin joint here and a hanger with an E hanger uh, to allow that movement to take place without affecting the truss significantly. And there's a cross section of that gusset plate there. Gives you an idea of uh, the scale of it. This is in Cullum Engineering's workshop in Fongaray as it was then. And uh, you can see it was built in two parts because he couldn't fit the whole thing into his workshop. Uh, it was built in two parts. You can see working going on here. There's, there's not too many high-vis jackets or anything uh, visible, but a major undertaking for any fabricator uh, at that time. And even now, I would suggest, although the capabilities around the country are much greater now than they were then. Again, you can see the sort of scale of things. Uh, it's tempting to want to get up and tighten up those bolts, but of course, this is just a mock-up. And here, here it is, the assembly in Cullum Engineering's yard. Uh, you will notice the sort of different health and safety aspects of this sort of fabrication than would be the case now with uh, uh, this person, uh, whatever they're doing, they've just climbed the ladder and they're hanging over the uh, diagonal. Close up of that uh, gusset plate being inserted into the pipe, uh, welded along both sides and then uh, welded, having the, the tubes, the diagonal tubes welded to them. Well, built in two halves, and then we decided we must have a test. Uh, one of the things I didn't mention, I should go back and just mention with the welding, we employed uh, a specialist um, group to monitor the welding, to test the welding, just about all the weldings at separate expense over and above any fees that we might charge. So this was a very important aspect to give us the confidence and the peace of mind that the welds were uh, doing the job that they needed to do. So that was a significant uh, extra cost, which I'll refer to later. Oops, run back. So built in two halves and bolted together at the middle, as you can see, bolted connection there and there, and another one on the bottom cord on the other side. Uh, it was set up in Cullum's yard in Wong Phong Ray, uh, and there were platforms built here full of sand bags to provide the, the load that we needed, and jacks were used to bring load into the, into the assembled truss in Cullum's 
yard. As you can see there, quite, a, quite an operation to get the requisite uh, loading capability there so that we could jack down on uh, there and put load into this newly assembled truss. Communications, or there's a, there's a picture of the, the uh, <clears throat> test going on, checking the deflections with the level. Uh, there's David Tom, who was the partner in charge. Um, myself, I think that might be David Cullen and a, and a guy called Alan Bilkey, who was an engineer on the job, uh, working with me. Uh, communications were somewhat uh, more primitive. Uh, the, we, we, we thought pretty proudly that we'd had a radio, but uh, these days would be much different. Uh, this would be a computer in today's um, climate rather than a clipboard and a sheet of paper. But Wong Fong Ray turned on a, a very good day for us for the test, or it might have been a couple of days. I'm not sure I recall exactly. But when we finished the test, which was successful, uh, David Cullum. Uh, turned on a barbecue of um, reasonable proportions. He, he turned on another barbecue, which involved applying a gas torch to some old railway sleepers and using a crane to place a, a plate of steel over the fire and then putting the eggs and sausages on that. So there was some memorable moments uh, offside, you know, alongside the, uh, um, the, the work that we were doing. The University of Auckland helped us with this uh, test. Um, but again, Barry Davidson and uh, Robin Shepherd, who was on the staff at that time, uh, helped us with the strain gauging. And so we were able to verify that the strains and, and deflections were of the order that we were expecting. Now the two halves, once the test was finished, the two halves were split up and they were put on a barge and they were taken around um, North Cape, which was a little bit of a, a worry because uh, the weather can be pretty bad there, but they survived and they were then taken here to only hung a wharf on the barge. You can actually see the motorway bridges uh, that were, uh, or that are now, which is under construction at that time. In fact, there was a very long strike uh, where those this construction of that bridge was those bridges was delayed somewhat. The two halves were taken by road to the site, uh, and of course this is a this is a slide that's harking back a bit. Uh, there were very significant temporary works to be done in order to erect these towers and cross beams in order to have a, a crane basically to lift the truss and move across into position. So this is, uh, shows uh, this um, operation going on. And here we have the old existing buttress, the new buttress, the frame ready to take the truss, the tie, which is an extension of the top cord of the existing truss. What's happened there? Oops. Um, that tie is, is all ready to go. And again, here, just a reminder of the existing structure uh, and the truss sitting there waiting uh, to be lifted up and then brought across into position. And there it is there, and it's going about halfway up. And you can see that aircraft maintenance is going on in the adjacent bays. You can see here the uh, tie, which will come down and you and a yoke here, which, which uh, goes either side of this existing truss. And there's a little crossbar there. I'll show you a bit more of that in a minute. There it is halfway up and a, a plane in the corner of my photo uh, there just to again emphasize that all this was going on while work was going on in the um, other bays. 
Now that airplane there belonged to David Cullum, who was the contractor from Pongaray, and he enjoyed very much being able to fly down from Pongaray and taxi right up to the site. And so you always knew whether he was there or not because his plane would be there. I had the pleasure of flying with him a couple of times. Again, same, same stage of work, uh, but a different, different angle. Uh, I think a few people would have stopped doing what they were doing to watch this kind of operation. And there's the, there's the truss being lifted up, uh, ready to, it's at full height, ready to shift across into position. And here's some people preparing the supports. Uh, the truss is actually in position here. You can see it here, the new truss, and they're just making sure it's bedding down properly into these uh, supports. There it is in position. You can see these uh, the, the uh, gantry beams and the crane systems. Uh, here is a post which is directly on top of the existing uh, column. And here you can see, well, uh, you can barely see, but uh, somewhere along there is the little hanger that will take and lift up. There's the top cord of the existing truss there. And here's one of these hangers, which actually is in the, in the center span, picking up uh, part of that span. So I'll try not to be too complicated here because it's, it's how do we get the load into the truss? Well, this hanger, the tube hanger that you saw had a little cross beam with some holes in it. Uh, we, drill through the top cord here at position we want to lift up. We put a little cross plate here, a billet of steel basically with holes in it. Another cross beam here to transfer from these bolts to these bolts here. So you're picking up that cross beam. Jacks are applied here and here to pull on those bars. That pulls, it pulls this crossbar up and that pulls, lifts up and puts load into the existing truss here. Now, these were actually McAloy bars, for those of you who are familiar with those pre-stressing bars. And that's, of course, the temporary load carrying situation. The permanent load carrying situation, there was a yoke plate here like this, which came either side of the existing cord. And once all the loads were transferred, was welded uh, in position to take, take the loads and then allow the McAloy bars and the jacks and everything to be taken away. Catch up with my notes here. Yeah. Now, there was a bit of an incident with these uh, bars, uh, as I'll come to. Uh, Go back there. We put strain gauges on these bars while we were jacking them, and we, we, we took a lot of trouble to calculate the weight of the existing roof, almost counting up the number of rivets and the, the size of the welds and the weight of the cladding and everything. And we thought we had a pretty good handle on what sort of loads we would need to, to lift the new truss and take out the loads from its top and bottom cords. Uh, early on, well, we hadn't jacked for very long before we realized we were about 10% over uh, the expected loads. And this is really quite a concern, although it doesn't sound too much. Um, and we're, this was a statically determinate structure. Were we picking up loads somehow? Was it, were we picking up loads from somewhere else we shouldn't be somehow? Uh, what was going on? So we stopped the job and we double check the weights and double checked around to see that we weren't picking up anything else that we shouldn't have been picking up in terms of weight. And um, you can see that it was um, uh, quite a stressful time. But we found after a couple of days of investigation that uh, strangely, McAloy bars have a, a um, modulus of elasticity, which is about 10% lower than most mild steels. 
and we've been converting the strains on the McAloy bars using mild steel um, modulus uh, to get the to get the stress in them. And uh, once we made that correction, we were actually spot on with our loads, much to our relief. Now, once we'd finished the jacking and transferred the loads, um, don't you love this slide? David Cullum here is cutting the bottom cord of the new truss, of the, of the existing truss, sorry, um, to, because the loads have been jacked out of it. And here he is sitting astride the, the bottom cord. Uh, not sure about the steel toe caps there. Uh, I think there's a little platform to catch the um, spray from the cutting, but there he is very relaxed. Now, I made sure that I was up on top of the um, roof at the time we were transferring the load. And uh, Dave Cullen sent someone up to me when he, he and, and they said to me, well, now you've, we've cut through, this is, a, this, this cord here is about 400 millimeters uh, square and 25 millimeter steel thick. So there's quite a lot of steel there. Uh, David was, Dave Cullen was cutting the cord and he sent someone up to tell me that he'd cut all but one inch. Well, it's a 68 inch circumference, all but one inch and it was starting to pull apart. And did I want to adjust the forces in the jacks? I decided that um, one inch and 68, which is about one and a half percent, is pretty accurate, and that no, he should just carry on and cut, which he did. There was a bit of a dull thud as, as that uh, last piece of, of steel gave way, uh, but happily the hanger stayed in place. And we came down quite relieved. And you might think that, uh, and this is 1976, so there were not a lot of selfies in those days. So, but I did have the presence of mind to try and capture David Cullum and myself uh, in the days where I had hair and including sideburns um, after, you can see the relief uh, uh, after uh, successfully doing this major operation of transferring the load. Once all that was done, it was a matter of constructing the new walls and roof. And there you have the situation uh, as it is at the moment, uh, at the end of the project here, and a bit of a closer view. Again, you can see the way the doors crib a little bit of space there. They do have tie downs, which I'll come to in a, in a minute, a little story about those. They are actually on double rails um, and there's a little tongue plate that sits inside there to stop them, stop them from being blown upwards. Now, so that was really the end of that project, but not very long afterwards, uh, in New Zealand decided they needed to uh, enclose a 747 and um, so they modified the doors so that they could actually bring them either side uh, to protect the environment while they were working on the planes. And this is a photograph I took something around about 2019, I think, uh, when we were taxiing up the airport. And uh, you can see there that they've also managed to do that, which means the tailplane of the 747 has gone through that gate there, which was created by the having the new truss and the, the cutting there. And civil aviation um, later um, insisted that this truss be painted red and white because it breached their um, um, flight uh, safety, safety margins there. So it's within that sort of safety envelope. So it had to be painted. So some Notable facts about this project, the, the contract, as I recall, was about $2 million, which doesn't sound much, does it? But it's about 100 million today, I decided. Uh, and 
I mentioned the cost of the welding quality assurance. This was a very important part of the, of the project to get um, peace of mind about what was being done for such a major thing. There, should, there can be no mistakes. And this was paid by the client and it would have been about a million dollars uh, extra today. So, note. Some memorable moments. Well, I, I think I've, I've covered most of those really going through working close to the aeroplanes, lifting the truss into position. Uh, it was uh, pretty hair raising stuff, but uh, done particularly competently by the team of Downers and Cullen Engineering. I've mentioned the jacking load. That was a couple of days I'd rather not have had, but very memorable. Uh, cord cutting. Now, the door jam. This is a bit of an illustration of, of I'm sure many of you can relate to what happens on contracts. I got a phone call from David Cullum uh, back in my office in Auckland to say that he couldn't move the doors. And it was obviously our fault uh, being the consultants and would I come out and fix it for him? So I came out to the airport and, and it turned out that he'd, he'd, he said he'd, he'd hooked there's a thing called a fox tractor, which is used for pulling the aircraft around. He'd hooked that onto the doors and pulled as hard as he could, and he still couldn't move them. And I, I just couldn't believe that he would have done that because he could have pulled the whole hangar down. But happily, there was a much simpler explanation to what had happened. And the little tongue plate that sits between the rails had gone to one side in the slot. Uh, near the existing buttress, there was a slot where that could have been put in and then slid, slid along to the doors. And this T, this little T that came down, had gone sideways and got stuck. So he was really just pulling the lower uh, beam of the door. Once we sorted that out, the doors were working fine. But um, that was a memorable moment, I can tell you. <clears throat> Now, some of the things that uh, Martin and I discussed when we were talking about this was, well, you know, what has stayed the same and what's changed in the in the projects? Well, a uh, pretty obvious statement here, what has stayed the same? Gravity acts downwards 24-7, it doesn't sleep. And you need to, you know, any engineer, structural engineer knows that and knows how important it is to get everything right. We had similar budget constraints and time constraints uh, to what was now, I suspect now is much more in, in the uh, uh, design and construction industry. Safety considerations are paramount. That's never going to change, hopefully. Uh, certainly not going to change an engineer's mind. Very disciplined approach is needed, and that's, that hasn't changed with projects of this nature. Peer reviews are probably much more formal now. We did independent checks. We had reviews within in-house. Uh, at various stages of design. Um, and those are the sorts of things that projects still have and must still have. What has changed? Well, quite a few things. Um, quality assurance regimes, I think, are much more formal. I mean, when we asked for this quality assurance on the welding, it was, I mean, a one off. I mean, it wasn't, we didn't have a whole lot of people to to call on, we had to make it happen and, and get the expertise brought together. In the old days, we might call them, we had clerks of works which were who were employed over and above consultants fees to basically be on site full time and make sure that the work was being built in accordance with the contract drawings and documentation. They've sort of fallen out of use. Um, there's many of us who think that it's because buildings are a one-off, they're a prototype, uh, this is a good backstop to have uh, someone who is there and their only job is to make sure things are being done okay. Health and safety requirements have certainly changed as you have seen. Um, it's amazing to think how much they've changed people rail on about current requirements, but um, including me, but I, I must say, you, you can't argue with them. 
But what you must remember, what, what I thought, looking back on this project, I think the people that did the work, very much responsible for their own safety. They knew what was they were putting themselves into and they could take precautions. And I think that applies still, even though there might be plenty of other backstops. Uh, your safety, the first person responsible for your safety is you, I believe. Something that's really outstandingly different, uh, stunningly different, is access to knowledge. Uh, this is something that's taken place in, in my professional career across that. Paper, libraries, um, word of mouth. Uh, I wondered what to do, how to weld the steel in these pipes, uh, techniques, what sort of, um, what, what must I specify? The Ministry of Works and Development uh, had a lot of experts in those days. They, they became, they were later privatized and became opus and in a, in a totally different sort of scene um, but i was able to access a number of critical people in there who who had specialist knowledge uh, that helped me uh, decide on the specifications and um, whatnot but compare that with today unbelievable sophistication of analysis well again just crazy uh, I wouldn't say we were totally using slide rules and calculators. We did have access to three-dimensional analysis of the trusts from um, Barry Davidson at University of Auckland. But when I compare that with, certainly for earthquake, with the sort of three-dimensional non-linear time history analyses, um, doing an analysis for the structure every hundredth of a second or whatever, uh, it is just stunning. Um, <clears throat> earthquake, wind, and geotech considerations, very much more simple, shall we say. The sophistication was not there. Basically, the earthquake was a sideways load of X percent G, and of course, a pretty simple structure and a very stiff one too, so not going to be... Um, wind, wind, the wind code has got much more complex since this sort of job was done, and I know that geotechnical considerations would be much more thoroughly and more detailed in these days. Now, <clears throat> fees are another thing. They're about one half now in percentage terms of what they were then. The Institution of Professional Engineers at the time had a minimum scale fees for structural engineers, and the structural engineering fee was about double what it is now. So there was budget pressure uh, was a lot less. Um, shall we say, and less training, less training now. Um, I made a presentation some years ago, in which I noted that our company was spending, and these figures are approximate, about 10% of its annual budget on uh, bidding for work and promoting itself, and about 2% on training staff. And I expressed the wish that it would be nice if we could make those uh, the other way around, but it's uh, very difficult. Competition for design work was non-existent at that in 1976. It wasn't long after that it started to become um, the norm, but we were not allowed to advertise our company or our, our skills. Uh, you could promote yourself sort of individually to, to people that you happen to bump into, but you certainly couldn't put ad advertisements and magazines and promote yourself in any way. And nor was bidding for projects really, it wasn't common at all. In fact, I'm not sure that we're any at that particular time. It became common. Uh, we were Air New Zealand's consultant at that stage, and we used to sit down with them and they would say, well, now here's our forward work program over the next few years, and we want you to make sure that you've got the resources uh, to help us with these projects. And we say, yep, yeah, no problem. Well, Martin encouraged me to sort of think about success factors. Um, again, we'll just look at those. I think the fact that it's a technical focus and, and the technical aspects are a priority and it was recognized by all. I think you, you give that away at your peril uh, in any any project involving structural engineering. 
It was a simple, bold concept, lots and lots of attention to detail, every little bit. We had in-house reviews. There was, a, there was a discipline within our practice that the partners would, would have a meeting whereby their designers would propose what they were, proposed solutions to problems at preliminary design, developed design and working drawing stages. And they would basically then bring their experience to bear to try and shoot down any crazy ideas or um, that, that might emerge from younger engineers. The, the Territorial Authority had a chief engineer, uh, so they were able to understand what we're doing. We were tapping into experience of David Tom and Neil Allardyce, who were the original designers of that hangar. We had very capable contractors and downers and column engineering. Uh, we did a full scale test. It's hard to imagine that you wouldn't in such a situation. We did the extra QA with the welding and there was mutual respect and dare I say common sense evident in, uh, in this project. There's one particular incident, the, the buttress, the diagonal of the buttress has a, a post tension cable inside it to stop it from cracking when it comes under tension. And Jack Byrne, the Downer's manager called me to site one day and said, look, oh, look, David, we've, we've stuffed up here. We've put all the reinforcing steel around it and we haven't put enough, we haven't put what you've said you wanted around this anchorage. And I knew, knew very well that you need to anchor and so will you, anyone who's worked with post-tensioning cables, you need to have a very substantial grid of steel around that to stop um, bursting uh, near the anchorage. And he said, well, if you want me to take it all out and start again, I'll do it. But if we can find a way uh, that will prevent doing that, that would be most appreciated. Well, we did find a way. And that helps to build this sort of mutual respect. Yeah. And uh, building's still there. So that's about it. Um, I just final tribute to David uh, Allen Tom, who was the partner in charge and who was a mentor for me during this. David, um, he died on the 19th of January 2017, but he was a, C a CBE, he was in the RAF, and this gave him his contacts with uh, Air New Zealand, and that's how the firm came to have that. He's a past president of IPENS, or Engineering New Zealand, and one of, one of the early and strongest uh, advocates in environment, uh, in, in the environment. You can look him up on Engineering New Zealand, dot org website so thank you for your attention and uh martin i guess you've got some questions i do we'll um we'll wait for a few more to come through the uh q a typically those start to those take a couple of minutes after the presentation ends but i've got a few which i've not noted down one of which just a comment really was that reading through the presentation before uh, before you put it on, I hadn't really uh, understood the scale of the project. And when you walked through it, it was um, it's really quite exceptional, isn't it? So congr congratulations for a um, <laughs> for a really yeah that was. I remember discussing it with you over the phone, and you said um, you looked back on it now and and thought to yourself, you know, how did I ever have the confidence to be able to do that? <laughs> and um, yes. Um, very good. Well, it's the, happening every day, of course. It's happening every day with other structures of, you know, similar and greater proportion. But uh, that's, I mean, can people hear us now? Yes. Because one of, one of the things I meant to say was uh, in relation to the contractors, the Downers and Cullums and the people, you know, we designers, we come up with these things, but we rely on, um, we rely on, people of that sort of capability who, who are able to, to get out there in the field and just do it. Uh, some pretty pioneering and, and brave, brave things. So without them, we wouldn't have these major structures. I'm thinking of any major structure, if you like, the Burj Khalifa or whatever. Mm, absolutely. 
that was one of the first questions that I thought was, did you did you have a, a contractor in mind, or uh, or, or were you con or were you consistently using uh, the, the contractor when you came into the project? No, this was this would have been this was put out to open open bid, and uh, there were one or two or three major contractors. There were also other steel fabricators. Uh, uh, available and, and would have been in other bits. I can't recall exactly the situation there. And so when you, it occurred to me that, you know, you, you really got to make sure with that type of project that when you are uh, designing the connections and so on, they have to actually be able to be built, you know? And how much collaboration did you, did you get from the contractor? Um, in the design process when you were when you were doing that uh, that with a particular contract and none at all i mean basically i think there's enough precedence to know that these sorts of things can be done um i would have i would have checked with some of these specialist people at ministry of works and others but uh largely yes it's capable of being done uh in terms of that's in terms of of the fabrication but it's a massive, um, certainly in terms of the, the temporary work in order to get the truss into place and whatnot. Yes, certainly discussions very much that's there. It's, the, it's for them to do, not for us to do. It's for us, for them to devise and us to check. Yeah. So that was very much their uh, ideas and techniques that did it. And it's, it's amazing to think when you, when you look at that and it's going on every day with other projects. Yes. Right and uh, when you were going through and doing the, the Q&A for it, um, both internally and uh, I don't, um, I, I know that you had Barry involved, but did you actually have a, a formal peer review conducted of it or was it an all internal checking? I'm not sure I can remember that. I don't believe we did. I don't believe we had an external peer review on it. I could be wrong, but I don't recall it. But, and, but, um, and how did you, or how did the company rather, uh, sort of determine where the, where the risks were and, and, and go through the checking process? Was that you know, the experience of a senior engineer said, I want to be checking these particular parts or, um, or did they just keep a, an eye over it as you went through it? Well, one, one of the, well, it was a bit more than that. I mean, what, uh, these partner reviews that we had internally, they are the ones that were taking the responsibility for the quality of the work of the firm. So whenever proposals were made at these partner meetings, uh, they were very, very thorough and um, conscientious, if you like, though, probing, looking for problems. What about this? What about that? always. Uh, I think I might have mentioned to you in discussion that Neil Allardyce had designed a roof for the grandstand at Matamata, I think, and it had blown off. And so uh, you couldn't, any roof that you did, it had to be very well secured. It didn't matter what the code said, uh, uh, it had to be very secure. And, and when you, and you just multiply that up with the experience of other people, um you get quite a benefit yeah absolutely and uh Bo Lu has come through and he said could you explain a bit more of the connection to the bottom cord and what can you improve for the connection what would you uh oh, what can you improve for the connection at the time if you are looking back at it now how would you improve it essentially well, I'm not sure what is this. This is the connection of the diagonals to the bottom cord, I presume. Um, I, I'm not sure I would do it differently, but I would, I would look to to make a profile joint out of that with profile cutting and welding of the the intersections there. But I would want to know, probably through some sort of finite element analysis. Uh, where the stresses were going and and that that um 
the joint would behave okay and that the welds could be done without um, creating problems due to the weld pull or any other metallurgical problems as well. And that kind of leads me on to the next question really. Um, if you were doing the same project again, would you change how much of the checking would you change now that you've got the likes of uh, computer analysis um, available to you? Uh, that's a that's a good question because um, uh, we we have, don't we? We have got very sophisticated analytical tools now, and the temptation is to use them, and even even to the extent to think that the more calculations we do, the better the building is going to stand up. Uh, would that would be nice if that were the case? So. This is a fairly simple structure, but I, I'm sure if we were to do it today, there would be a lot more um, investigation into the soils, into the response of the building uh, to earthquake, uh, into settlement, uh, possible settlement that is. Um, probably much more analysis of the, the truss itself and possibly even some of the joints. Uh, because you can do it. And when you can't do it, you don't do it. Uh, but you find a way of convincing yourself that what you're doing is, is okay. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And of course, one of the great things of it and necessary thing, I mean, it would be an interesting question to ask, well, would you still do a test, even though you did lots more sophisticated analysis today? And my answer would be yes. And why? Well, I think the answer is obvious because you're doing it at that sort of, um, uh, it's, it's right, right next door. It's an existing structure. Very important. Uh, you don't want any mistakes at all. And if there is some problem with the bolts that connect the two parts together or whatever, um, then you want to know. And so you would not. Uh, you would always have a test, I believe in a situation like that. And uh, being that as it is with uh, the highly corrosive environment, um, did you put in, so I'm assuming that it was, uh, I'm not sure what sort of coatings that you used upon it, but have you got a, uh, you know, a maintenance schedule or is that done by, um, by Auckland Airport? Uh, well, no, this would be New Zealand. This is Air New Zealand's facility, of course, um, but they would they would be responsible for that. But certainly, uh, the the corrosion protection was another aspect which I didn't really um, go into. I learned a lot of a lot about different things on this project. One was about uh, non destructive testing for welding, and another was about uh, corrosion protection. Um, a lot of people at that stage sort of guaranteed their paints and the corrosion protection systems, et cetera, et cetera. But uh, that's as far as they took it. Once, once it was applied, that's none of their business. And later on, it became more common for people to sort of take that responsibility right through to providing a product and uh, putting their name behind a, uh, the application of it as well. So, this had probably as high a specification as you'd want for corrosion protection. And um, the last thing I would uh, we've, we've got is uh, the collaboration with a client. I see that, I think it's WSP, have started a long-term collaboration now with Watercare up in Auckland. Uh, and that I think is, is a, a you know, you were talking about the collaboration between the firm that you were working for and, and Air New Zealand, and you had that surety of business, I suppose, which meant that you probably could invest in the training and uh, you knew the, the workflow that was coming up and so on. Do you think that that's a, um, you know, when you do have a good collaboration with your client like that, that is beneficial to both parties? Oh, I think that's undoubtedly the case. I mean, it's not that you, I mean, you're not, it doesn't apply to everything, but it's, um, it was very helpful in terms of work planning. 
Although none of, none of these, one of the things about engineering, consulting engineering is, is the workflow is sort of never guaranteed. Um, even, even with a client like in New Zealand, I mean, you, they didn't really know when they would need these things. Well, they could, they could predict it, but it's not, it's not a continuous flow for a design engineer. Uh, so you've always got that to juggle with anyway. It just became um, a completely different exercise for us doing um, uh, assessments of what sort of resources we would need in our practice to deal with the upcoming work uh, when you factor in the chances of success of various bids. Yeah, that makes sense. Okay, well, look, that's... Um... 12.57, so we've, we're finishing right on time. And uh, I just wanted to say, look, thank you very much. I've personally learned a lot from speaking to you and, and watching the webinar. And uh, I'm sure that a lot of other people have as well. Thank you very uh, much. Thank you one and all. And, uh, and no doubt we will keep in touch in the future. Your design features report, uh, the, the spreadsheet uh, oh, yes. that David mm -hmm. provided uh, as an example, is freely available now through the Engineering New Zealand website. If anybody would like uh, to understand, to know where a copy of that is, that they can just download and use, then um, please pop a question into the chat and we will uh, we'll provide a link or we'll just send it out with the um, we'll just send it out with the webinar. That's, that's that, um, Martin, that's a... Um, um... Excel spreadsheet, isn't it? And it's readily adaptable, but I think it takes you a long way to uh, summarizing what you what all are the key key things to your um, any design. I've had very positive feedback from people uh, when they've seen it so far. So thank you very much. We've um, okay. we've been circulating it far and wide. Brilliant. Thanks. And at that, I will I will leave okay. you for today. Thanks for that. Thanks, Martin. Thank you. Appreciate your time. Cheers. Bye.